Welcome to part four of this series of slideshows that explores the hidden history of anesthesiology. This final slideshow will explain the circumstances that led the anesthesiology profession to be founded on the basis of a flawed anesthetic technique that has derailed professional progress for the past 50 years and led to a crisis that threatens professional survival. Reform is essential to restore professional advance and prevent professional self-destruction. Carbon dioxide has played a pivotal role in the evolution of anesthesia. Confusion about the anesthetic properties of carbon dioxide can be traced to the 1823 experiments of Henry Hill Hickman, a British physician. Hickman is presently remembered as the first person to employ a gaseous agent as a form of anesthesia but he might be better be remembered as the first physician to confuse anesthesia with asphyxiation. He placed animals in containers and flooded them with 100% carbon dioxide until they collapsed, and then subjected them to surgical procedures. Many of the animals suffered convulsions and some of them died, but since they didn't move during the procedures and most of them survived, Hickman prematurely concluded that he had discovered an important means to prevent surgical pain. His British contemporaries correctly attributed his observations to asphyxiation and ridiculed his report as humbug. He died young and some, some believe he died of suicide. Strangely, even in recent times, his report has been incorrectly cited as evidence that CO2 has anesthetic properties. Both anesthesia and asphyxiation can produce sustained reversible loss of consciousness. However, there are obvious differences. Genuine anesthetic inhalation agents produce progressive dose-dependent euphoria and loss of consciousness. They produce additive effects when combined with other hypnotic agents. They inhibit seizure activity or addictive and they have a wide margin of safety even though they cause dose-dependent toxic depression of cardiac and respiratory function. They cause only mild respiratory acidosis and they do not cause cyanosis. In contrast, carbon dioxide is unpleasant to inhale and it causes a sudden loss of consciousness that is unrelated to the effects of, other hyp of hypnotic agents. It causes seizures and deaths at concentrations only slightly higher than necessary to produce unconsciousness. CO2 addiction is unknown. CO2 enhances respiratory drive and cardiac efficiency in moderate concentrations, but asphyxiating concentrations of 30% or more cause severe metabolic acidosis that is closely associated with cyanosis, seizures, and death. Cyanosis, of course, cannot be readily observed in animals because of their pigmented tissues. Dr. Ralph Waters was the venerated founder of the anesthesiology profession. He attended medical school at Case Western Reserve during the era of George Washington Cryle. He founded a busy outpatient surgery clinic in Iowa where he maintained an interest in research and academic involvement despite his busy private practice. At one point he voluntarily left private practice to spend three years at the Mayo Clinic to learn regional anesthesia from Dr. John Lundy. He worked with Arthur Goodell to develop the cuffed endotracheal tube and demonstrated its utility at medical meetings by plunging his anesthetized pet dog into a tank of water. He introduced endobronchial anesthesia and cyclopropane. He researched CO2 absorbance and helped introduce soda lime. He developed the water's canister that provided a simple and efficient means to conserve expensive anesthetic gases and prevent excessive CO2 accumulation. His determination to establish anesthesiology as an independent medical specialty can be traced to 1919 when he published a paper entitled Why the Professional Anesthesiologist. In 1927 he was recruited to, f to form the first anesthesia department in the world at the University of Wisconsin 
where he subsequently introduced new equipment, practices, and standards, implemented board certification, and established anesthesiology as an independent specialty. Dr. Waters became alarmed by the CO2 asphyxiation disasters long before he became a department chairman, and he viewed Yandel Henderson's research with skepticism. From 1929 to 1938, he performed research and published three influential papers that reversed uh, CO2 perceptions and re um, revised anesthesia practice, ha practices, habits, beliefs, and standards. The first of these papers was entitled Carbon Dioxide, Its Place in Anesthesia. In it, he stated, quote, Fortunately and unfortunately, the researches in carbon dioxide of the New Haven School of Physiologists have entered the literature of anesthesia in the past decade. Fortunately, because these researches are brilliant and have taught us many facts of the greatest importance, unfortunately, these facts have been made use of by practical anesthetists in some quarters to make easy their work without sufficient investigation as to what bioeffects may accompany the altered physiology which their methods induce. Let us not allow the spectacular results of stunt flying in anesthesia to make us forget sound principles. The mere fact that anesthesia can be more quickly and conveniently induced and terminated by the use of carbon dioxide is not sufficient grounds for administering that gas. Note that in all three papers Dr. Waters uh, published, he persistently ignored the benefits of CO2. He also confused CO2 asphyxiation with corn silo poisoning, which is caused by methane asphyxiation. Soon after he became chairman at Wisconsin in 1927, Dr. Waters and Dr. Chauncey Leakey, the chairman of the pharmacology department at Wisconsin, performed an important experiment that altered anesthesia evolution. Their experiment was inspired by Hickman's misguided claims that CO2 has anesthetic properties. Like Hickman, they fell victim to the confusing chemistry of CO2. They placed rabbits in open boxes and flooded the boxes with various mixtures of CO2 and oxygen. They probably employed tanks of carbogen, which were readily available in that era. Waters summarized the results as follows, quote, We have found that 30 to 50 percent carbon dioxide with oxygen will anesthetize rabbits in about a minute's time without apparently causing much excitement and usually without struggling. Placed in chambers to which such a mixture is supplied, these animals will move about sniffing and breathing more deeply than usual. Muscular activity is gradually depressed and when anesthesia comes on, muscular relaxation is marked. At this time, the respiration is much deeper but the rate is ab about the same as normally. Upon removal from the chamber into the normal atmosphere, recovery is prompt and apparently without after effect. Both anesthesia and asphyxiation reversibly disrupt consciousness and therefore produce superficially similar symptoms. Leakey and Waters mistakenly reasoned that asphyxiation is impossible in the presence of inspired oxygen levels more than twice as high as found in atmospheric air. Many years later, in an interview at UC San Francisco, Leakey confirmed his, this mistake. Quote, well, in 1828, Henry Hill Hickman in England had reported on the anesthetic properties of carbon dioxide. Nobody had ever looked at it since that time, so Ralph Waters and I thought, well, we ought to take a look at it and see if he was right. So, a hundred years later, in 1928, we did put out a report on carbon dioxide as an anesthetic agent. 
it is 30 percent carbon dioxide and 70 percent oxygen so there is no possibility of asphyxiation that is anesthetic one can maintain as we did animals dogs rabbits and so on eight and ten hours in carbon dioxide anesthesia without any difficulty at all there is always a little trouble when they go over a little neck jerking and so on we tried it in humans but decided not to use it because it upset the surgeons and all the animals neck muscles would twitch but that would be over pretty quickly we never had guts enough to hold it in humans this would be fully physiological I haven't any idea how on earth it works nobody knows how anesthetic agents work as yet there are all kinds of theories unquote. a few a few years after his animal study paper in 1933 dr waters published a review paper entitled quote, the toxic effects of carbon dioxide unquote in which he provided examples that purport, purported to prove the toxic and narcotic properties of carbon dioxide However, all of the examples he provided are readily explained by CO2 asphyxiation. The first example he offered was that of the Grotto del Cane in Naples, Italy, which has been known since antiquity. Dr. Waters never traveled to Europe, and he never personally inspected this phenomenon. The Grotto del Cane, or dog's cave, is not really a cave. It is a volcanic feature called a fumarole, that continuously discharges carbon dioxide into a small subterranean passage that is only nine meters long. The floor of the passage is depressed so that, so that a shallow lake of invisible carbon dioxide forms to a depth of about 30 sonometers. The continuous flow inflow of carbon dioxide maintains dangerous carbon dioxide levels in the depressed floor of the passage while air movement reduces carbon dioxide to safe levels toward the ceiling. People entering the passage, accompanied by a dog, do not feel any difference because their head is above the carbon dioxide lake, but the dog suffers asphyxiation and collapses. If CO2 had genuine toxic effects, like mustard gas, then it would cause persisting symptoms, but the same dogs were exposed repeatedly to the grotto without harm. The example thus provides no evidence of CO2 toxicity. Dr. Waters next provided this dramatic description of a CO2 asphyxiation disaster from an anonymous source. Quote, the patient was a well-developed girl of 15 who entered the hospital with a chief complaint of tenderness localized at McBurney's Point. Her temperature was 101.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Her pulse was about 85 and respirations 20. Chest examination was negative. An appendectomy was advised. To produce anesthesia, I employed nitrous oxide induction followed by ether with the absorp absorption technique. The machine did not absorb carbon dioxide very well at any time. The anesthesia was well established with ether and the operation begun, the patient having excellent color the respirations about 26, pulse 90, pupils small and extrinsic muscles of the eyeball paralyzed when she began to have small constant twitchings of the face. A short time later there appeared a small clonic body convulsion. I thought of anoxemia as a cause even though respirations were not depressed, pupils small, pulse good and color good. Oxygen was administered ether was deepened, then abandoned, then reapplied, and various other procedures tried in an attempt to relieve the situation. These efforts included giving a lot of carbon dioxide because of possible alkalosis. The convulsions continued, getting steadily more violent. Her pulse rose to 120, and her temperature obviously increased. A half hour after the onset of the convulsions, she died. Unquote. 
The anonymous source went on to, to document that many observers believed that the problem was caused by asphyxiation. All of the symptoms, including the fever and convulsions, are consistent with brain hypoxia due to CO2 asphyxiation. Dr. Waters next recapitulated his 1929 experiment using carbon dioxide to anesthetize rabbits, offering this experiment as proof that CO2 has anesthetic effects. Then he casually confirmed that soon after the rabbit experiment, he had tested the anesthetic effects of carbon dioxide on three women, regardless of its purported toxicity. Quote, we then attempted to administer 30% oxygen as an anesthetic agent to three apparently normal women with the following result. The first was satisfactorily anesthetized for 13 minutes with no untoward result during inhalation. The second had a convulsion on the operating table during which the ward nurse appeared in the, in the doorway to ask, quote, Doctor, what shall I do? The first patient is in a convulsion. Unquote. The third patient tolerated 10 minutes of carbon dioxide anesthesia, which was then changed to nitrous oxide. That evening, none of the three appeared to be worse for the experience. Unquote. It is indeed fortunate that none of these patients suffered serious damage because the seizures that occurred in two of these three women are clear evidence of brain hypoxia secondary to asphyxiation. The remainder of the paper consisted of speculation about changes in vital signs induced by carbon dioxide that are easily explained by the unpleasant effects of breathing carbon dioxide while awake. Dr. Waters next provided a third example of purported CO2 toxicity that was derived from the same anonymous source. This time the anonymous source described purported CO2 toxicity in a newborn baby. Quote, Early this morning I was called to the ward to see a premature infant that was blue and hardly breathing in spite of a steady stream of carbon dioxide 5% and oxygen 95% or carbogen. It gave occasional twitching gasps. This time I recognized carbon dioxide toxemia and gave lots of pure oxygen at once and the infant rap rapidly improved. After being given some saline subcutaneously and one half hour of pure oxygen, it was crying lustily and in good condition. It seemed spectacular to the nurses how oxygen, not carbogen, was effective. In this hospital, I have been able to count 50 carbogen cylinders and only two oxygen cylinders available for therapeutic purposes." Unquote. Dr. Waters' commentary on this case was as follows, quote, If this man's experience was an isolated instance, it would be of little significance. On the contrary, his letter is one of many received in my office describing fatal and non-fatal cases of carbon dioxide poisoning. It is my belief that atmospheric atmospheres containing excess carbon dioxide are frequently toxic and often fatal to certain individuals. If illness has interfered with normal metabolism or if the transport of this waste product from the cells of the body to the experimental uh, atmosphere is handicapped by biological abnormality, by respiratory or cardiac deficiency, or by drug effect, any increase in the tension of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere inspired may prove detrimental." Unquote. Considering the historical importance of these anonymous reports, I contacted the Wood Library, the University of Wisconsin, and the University of California, San Francisco, all of which maintain historical collections of Waters' correspondence. All three of these sources reported that they had no such personal letters, and none of them had correspondence older than 1930. This is very strange, considering that Dr. Waters otherwise carefully preserved his correspondence. It is difficult to imagine how 5% carbogen 
could have caused toxicity in the baby because CO2 is harmless at levels as high as 10% and animals readily endure prolonged exposure to levels of 30% or more. Perhaps the simplest explanation is that an inexperienced nurse employed a tank of pure medical grade carbon dioxide instead of carbogen. Medical grade CO2 is normally stored at pressures above 760 torr so that most of the CO2 exists within the tank in liquid form. When released from such a tank, carbon dioxide can form a cool cloud that is temporarily affected by gravity and fills dependent spaces. This would explain why the baby became cyanotic and why it responded so readily to oxygen. However, this cannot happen with carbogen, which is stored at pressures below 760 torr, so that its mixture of 5% CO2 and 95% oxygen remains in stable gaseous state that is not affected by gravity. Regardless of his readiness to perform human experiments, Dr. Waters was clearly convinced that CO2 has dangerous toxic properties. In March 1938, he published the third paper, critical of CO2 supplementation, entitled Carbon Dioxide, in the Canadian Journal of Medicine. In this paper, he attacked Yandel Henderson by name and challenged Henderson's research evidence that CO2 has beneficial therapeutic effects. The vigor of his language is surprising when one considers that the CO2 toxicity phenomenon was widely understood as due to asphyxiation and that thousands of patients were routinely and harmlessly exposed to therapeutic CO2 supplementation during that era and Waters himself had trivial research experience compared to Yandel Henderson who was an internationally famous professional researcher who had published numerous careful gas physiology studies. Here are some examples from that paper. Quote, Clinical misapprehensions regarding the physiology of carbon dioxide seem to have had their inception in the work of Yandel Henderson in the early years of the present century. Henderson deduced from his experiments that surgical shock results from low carbon dioxide in the blood and tissues, that low carbon dioxide in the blood and tissues is a usual accompaniment of anesthesia, and that hyperventilation of the lungs by the use of carbon dioxide and oxygen mixtures should prevent postoperative pulmonary atelectasis. All three of these deductions are fallacious. I make this statement based upon my own personal experience in clinic and laboratory, verified amply by the experience and experiments of others. Henderson's assumption that anesthesia is accompanied by low carbon dioxide in the alveoli, blood, and tissues may have a, had a basis in the last century. Such is far from the case in anesthesia of the present day. First of all, we must not lose sight of the fact that it is a waste product of body metabolism, just as are the constituents of urine. Reduction in the physiological efficiency of respiration tends to dam back carbon dioxide in the tissues, just as physiological disturbances of the kidney tend to dam back the excretory products uh, usually eliminated th through that organ. Unquote. Two years later, in 1940, Dr. Henderson responded to these attacks with a scholarly re review of the history of CO2 research that summarized its beneficial clinical effects and uses and provided a summary of, its, of the studies that founded his viewpoint. Henderson's paper used the exact same title of carbon dioxide. Although he did not dignify Dr. Waters' attacks with a direct response, he probably had them in mind when he inserted this passage in his paper. Quote, the human mind is inherently inclined to take moralistic view of nature. Prior to the modern scientific era, which only goes back a generation or two, if indeed it can be said as yet 
even to have begun in popular thought, nearly every problem was viewed as an alternative between good and evil, righteousness and sin, God and the devil. This superstitious slant still distorts the conceptions of health and disease. Indeed, it is mainly derived from the experience of physical suffering. Lavoisier contributed unintentionally to the conception when he defined the life-supporting character of oxygen and the suffocating power of carbon dioxide. Accordingly, for more than a century after his death, and even now in the field of respiration and related functions, oxygen typifies the good and carbon dioxide is still regarded as a spirit of evil. There could scarcely be a greater misconception of the true biological relations of these gases." Unquote. History has declared the winner in this contest between a medical physician and a PhD researcher, and the outcome has altered not only the course of anesthesia, but that of medicine as well. Dr. Waters invented a new technique of general anesthesia that had practical advantages compared to the Kreil-Henderson technique. The Waters technique utilized intravenous barbiturate induction, curare paralysis, and elective intubation that was faster and more pleasant than mask induction. Paralysis prevented muscle tension and untoward movements and optimized surgical convenience. Elective intubation eliminated laryngospasm, aspiration, and airway obstruction, and accommodated a wider variety of surgical procedures. The Waters technique introduced mechanical hyperventilation to eliminate the CO2 toxicity problem, and it utilized toxic inhalation agent overpressure instead of morphine to control hypertension. The Aqua alumni quickly introduced the Waters technique and to this day it provides the foundation for general anesthesia throughout the world. This illustrates how many valuable babies have been discarded with the bathwater of anesthesia progress. Despite the protest of many surgeons, the water's conquest was so complete that the superior stress control of the Kreil-Henderson technique was soon forgotten. This diagram of the Aqua alumni tree explains how the Waters technique quickly displaced the Kreil-Henderson technique and became the standard anesthesia technique throughout the world. While the CO2 controversy raged, Dr. Waters successfully campaigned to create board certification for anesthesiology as an independent specialty, and he trained the first generation of anesthesiology residents, indoctrinated them with his ideas and methods, and guided them to prestigious board certification. He then, these became known as the Aqua alumni. Of the original 60 trainees at Wisconsin, 40 occupied teaching positions in academic centers for a major portion of their careers, and half of these became chairpersons or directors of academic programs in medical schools of the United States and elsewhere. The Aqua alumni were a cohesive group remarkably loyal to the chief. They faithfully attended yearly meetings in Madison where they refreshed their relationships with one another and Dr. Waters. Even today, thousands of practicing anesthesiologists can claim linkage to the Ralph Waters professional lineage through their own teachers and teachers' teachers. Despite its practical advantages, the Waters technique has caused far more problems than it solved. The devastating consequences of mechanical hyperventilation are only now becoming obvious. Hyperventilation damages lung tissues, decreases cardiac efficiency, and refuse, reduces tissue perfusion and oxygenation in the brain, bowel, and other vital organs and tissues. It also paralyzes respiratory chemoreceptors, impairs opioid clearance, and causes the so-called opioid hypersensitivity syndrome that has claimed hundreds, if not thousands, of victims. For hours after surgery, while respiratory chemoreceptors remain paralyzed, hyperventilated patients may stop breathing if they are, fall asleep for any reason, 
During this vulnerable period, small doses of opioids and sedatives may unpredictably precipitate sleep and respiratory arrest, especially in elderly patients. These disasters are typically attributed to the supposedly unpredictable effects of opioids, while the occult role of harmful hyperventilation invariably escapes notice because the victims appear to have completely recovered from anesthesia. The resulting fear of opioids has discouraged their use and thereby indirectly exaggerated stress-related postoperative problems including fever, tachycardia, hypertension, dysrhythmias, laryngospasm, dementia, bowel ileus, myocardial infarction, stroke, exaggerated pain, nausea, vomiting, and death. There are also substantial increases in cancer and heart disease in the distant aftermath of surgery. All these problems are exaggerated in elderly patients, and all of them could be substantially mitigated by effective opioid dosage to control surgical nociception. But opioids are incompatible with hyperventilation. The exaggerated reliance on muscle relaxants and toxic inhalation agent overpressure also exaggerates morbidity and mortality. Despite the practical advantages of the Waters technique, many surgeons preferred the superior stress control of the Kreil-Henderson technique. Spirited debate continued in the literature until 1960, when the entire November-December issue of An Anesthesiology Journal was devoted to a symposium entitled Carbon Dioxide and Man that consisted of some 17 authoritative papers that purported to review all aspects of CO2 physiology, toxicology, and chemistry. There was no discussion of the benefits of CO2 supplementation or the hazards of hyperventilation, and no mention of Kreil, Henderson, or Anosi Association. Meanwhile, ether was replaced by non-explosive, sweet-smelling halothane that facilitated fast mass conduction, and a new generation of open-circuit anesthesia machines replaced Jackson's closed-circuit machines and eliminated the as asphyxiation hazard. Nevertheless, the consequences of hyperventilation during anesthesia have been ignored by researchers, practitioners, and editors alike. In 19, the 1967 report of Eager, Isley, and Moalam is often cited as modern proof that carbon dioxide has anesthetic properties, but their misleading paper actually provides clear evidence of CO2 asphyxiation instead of anesthesia. Despite abundant evidence to the contrary, their report began with the questionable assumption that the earlier studies of Hickman and Waters had proved the anesthetic properties of CO2 beyond all doubt. Their stated objective was to clarify the relationship between CO2 narcosis and acidosis. They began the study by anesthetizing dogs with halothane. Then they installed arterial cannulas to sample arterial blood, CVP cannulas to sample venous blood, and brain ventricular can cannulas to sample cerebrospinal fluid. Then they gradually reduced the halothane while simultaneously increasing FiCO2 and taking sequential samples of these fluids for analysis. As FiCO2 approached 30%, they were able to eliminate the halothane altogether. Simultaneously, there was a sharp decline in pH in cerebrospinal fluid that was followed by de decreased pH in arterial and venous blood. This is clear evidence of asphyxiation. The, the acidosis was caused by anaerobic respiration due to cellular oxygen starvation that was most prominent in brain tissue, which has the highest oxygen requirement of all tissues. The acidosis was closely associated with seizures and deaths in the dogs, which is consistent with severe brain hypoxia, but inconsistent with genuine anesthetic effects. This study inexplicably failed to report PO2 data, even though the cannulas um, were used to report arterial pH and PCO2 values, and direct PO2 measurement is fundamental to all blood gas reports. Furthermore, their report made no mention 
of the asphyxiation of the possibility of asphyxiation. The missing PO2 data would have settled the matter. When I asked Dr. Eager via email if these experimental observations might be explained by CO2 asphyxiation rather than toxicity or anesthetic effects, he replied, quote, I think not, unquote. When I asked him why he failed to report PO2 data, he claimed that he could not recall the reason, but he insisted that his study reflected genuine CO2 narcosis rather than asphyxiation. These facts suggest that the researchers deliberately misrepresented their study. The Waters Technique perturbed prevailing beliefs in subtle ways. With the Kreil-Henderson Technique, practitioners routinely used morphine to control surgical stress, which minimized tachycardia and hypertension. Now, you know, 